Viewers, good afternoon. This is our another lecture on Six Sigma. We have already completed three lectures, and in the last lecture, we were discussing QC7 tools. Some of the tools we discussed, and we will continue with those tools today also. The next tool is graphs. As you all know, graphs are used in the form of XY diagrams. Two variables are there, one variable is shown on the x axis and the another variable is shown on the y axis. Normally, we use on x axis independent variables and on y axis we have dependent variables. Out of these two variables, we have one variable which is independent variable and the second one is dependent variable. Independent variable is always shown on x axis and the corresponding value of the y axis is shown on the y axis. These two variables are easily shown on a graph, but if we have variables which are more than two in number, how to show them in the graph form? So, we will discuss today showing the variables which are more than two in number on a graph, because two variables are easy to show on a graph, but we will discuss the variables which are more than two in number. And we have radar charts for these kind of variables. On the radar chart, we can show more than two variables, three variables, four variables and five variables. Now, let us have one example to demonstrate the use of radar chart. Say, for example, students have appeared in an exam consisting of five subjects and the performance of the students is to be shown on a graph for these five subjects and five subjects are more than two in number and we shall be using radar chart for this kind of problem. And here in this slide, I have shown the marks of five subjects of one of the students. And these subjects are mathematics, physics, chemistry, computer and English. And corresponding marks are also listed in the second column. And how to show them in the form of a graph? We shall be using radar chart. These five subjects will be in the form of a polygon which is pentagon and these marks will be drawn on the pentagon and this slide shows a pentagon and all the corners are joined with the center point and these five axes show the different subjects like physics, maths, English, computers and chemistry and when these are joined with the center these form a scale. On these scales, we show the marks of different subjects. And then finally, these points are joined with a polygon. Now, if we want to see the performance of a student, this polygon should be as large as possible and as uniform as possible. Why? The large polygon will show more marks for each subject and the uniform polygon will show that the student has worked equally well in all the subjects. And these kind of charts are very common when people use Six Sigma philosophy. For example, we have discussed 5S schemes to take care of housekeeping standards and 5S performance is checked by means of check sheets and different departments are viewed and checked on the check sheets for each 5S and their scores are given on those scales 
and the marks are shown on the radar chart for different S. So there are five S's and five S's means polygon of five sides will be formed. It will be a pentagon showing five S's and their scores in each functional areas. And we want that each polygon should be as large as possible and as uniform as possible. Why? Because we want that performance in all the areas of S should be equally good. No, nothing should be left behind so that the performance on 5 S is good for each functional area. And when shields are given for best performance and these scores are compared and checked and different functional areas getting the maximum scores are awarded also. And these radar charts are very commonly used where Six Sigma philosophy is utilized. The next one is histograms. Histogram is also in the form of graph, but in the form of bars or vertical lines are there. And the vertical lines show the value of the variable in that particular area. Suppose we want to give the information regarding the sales of a company for the last 10 years. For the last 10 years, these vertical bars will be drawn on the graph and length of the lines or the height of the lines will be proportional to the sales of that particular year and the years will be mentioned on the x axis. Similarly, we can have these vertical or horizontal bars and these are known as histogram. Why particularly we use these histograms? Because looking at the histogram, we are able to view the complete data and we can have the comparison in front of us. Where the vertical bar is lower than the other bar, we will find that the performance in that particular year is less as compared to the year where we have a vertical bar having larger heights. Similarly, if we are using horizontal bars, we can compare the length of the bars to show the performance of that particular year. And histogram is an easy way to understand the data and retain the data in our minds also. And this is one of the examples. And I have taken the example of Domino Pizza. And number of pizzas ordered are shown on the x-axis and the vertical bars times order. Say one pizza is ordered two pizzas are ordered, three pizzas are ordered. So one pizzas are ordered 33 times a day, two are ordered 65 times a day, three are ordered eight times a day, four are ordered 12 times a day. Then five and six never ordered and seven are ordered only once a day. So these graphs or the histograms show us the exact value of the information and the data and it is visible instead of having the statements written that this particular quantity of pizza was ordered these many times. But if we look at the graph, if we look at the histogram, we can have the data, we can retain the data in our minds also. Next tool is Pareto diagrams. Pareto is the name of the person who gave this idea of Pareto diagram. He is an Italian economist he found that most of the wealth in Italy is owned by only few people. And then he gave the idea of Pareto diagram or this is also known as 80-20 analysis. 80 percent of the wealth in Italy was owned by only 20 percent of the people. And if we extend this statement to the problem solving session, we can easily say that 80 percent of the problem can be solved by attending to 20 percent of the cases. So, we will discuss how this Pareto diagram is made and how this is viewed. Now, we will discuss one example. This is pizza home delivery defects. One of the pizza companies have studied the home delivery orders and found the defects in those particular orders. Out of these, late deliveries were 
15 times. Wrong topping was 6 times. Wrong size pizza were delivered 9 times. Pizza sticking to the case 7 times. Cold pizzas were delivered 10 times and partially eaten up pizzas were delivered 3 times. These were the defects viewed on 50 deliveries. If we add them, these are total 50 deliveries which were having defects. Now, pizza company wants to view and review these defects so that these defects are attended to and the customers get defect free pizza deliveries. And this study is made and with the study we have found that only 6 types of defects are found in the defective deliveries and this frequencies with defective pizza deliveries are also noted in this table and now how to go about it. These frequencies will put them in descending order, the highest one at the top and the lowest one at the bottom. In this sequence we have to note down these defects. <coughs> these are total 50 defects. If we put them in descending order, late deliveries were 15 times, cold deliveries were 10 times, wrong size 9 times, sticking pizzas were 7 times, wrong type 6 times and the eaten up were 3 times. Now, we have to put them in the form of histograms. If we put them in the form of histograms, we will get the histograms in this form and the curve is the cumulative curve which add up to 50. Now, if we go back to the previous slide, first one 15, second one 10 and likewise total are 50. If, I, if we want to attend to these problems, we will have the percentages calculated. Where it ends up to 80 percent, we will solve only those number of defects which add up to 80 percent because this is also known as 80-20 analysis. We will now go to the next slide which shows that on the right hand side of the slide percentages are also given. So, 80 percent and the number of defects <coughs> which are adding up to 15, 10, 25, 25 plus 9, 34, 34 plus 7, 41. 41 is 82 percent. First 4 defects if we are able to rectify then the problem of defective pizza deliveries are solved. So, first 4 defects will be solved in this case and the last 2 can be left as such. And this is given by the Pareto diagram and this is a problem solving tool. The next one is a scatter diagram. Scatter diagram again it is a in the form of a graph. Two variables, they are shown in the form of dots. One of them is shown on the <coughs> x axis and the another one is shown on the y axis. Similar to our earlier explanation, where we have said <coughs> independent variables are shown on the x axis and the dependent variables are shown on the y axis. Now, we have an example of sales expenditure in a company and the sales turnover achieved by the company. And we have around 10, 12 figures available with us. 15 cro crores spent on the sales expenditure and 289 is the corresponding sales in that particular year. Similarly, 23 crores spent on sales expenditure. Here the sales expenditure is nothing but giving advertisements in the newspaper channel or holdings and then 445 is the corresponding sales in that particular year. Similarly, in other years also we have listed the expenditure on sales and the corresponding sales turnover available by the company. Now, if we plot these points on x y diagram, we will have these points as shown in the next slide. Sales expenditure which is independent, it is shown on the x axis and the sales turnover is shown on the y axis. 
and the corresponding points which are available are shown on the sheet. Now, this shows some trend. If the sales expenditure is less, the corresponding sales turnover is also less. The, if we increase the expenditure on sales, then the sales turnover increases. This scatter diagram gives us some information regarding the effect of one variable on the other variable, or the effect of independent variable on the dependent variable. And from this, this looks like a straight line. We can have a regression line also. Here, sales regresses on the sales expenditure. And this regression line, we can have y is equal to mxc, and then we can calculate the fixed, uh, fixed component of the sales and the variable component of sale. Variable component is dependent on the sales expenditure, and the constant value does not depend upon the sales expenditure independent of the sales expenditure. Even if sales expenditure is 0, we will have some sales that will be given as a constant sales. And this we will get from the regression line obtained from these data. <coughs> this now completes the scatter diagram. Scatter di diagram is nothing but x, y points are shown on the graph and this gives us some trend or some relation between the independent variable and the dependent variable. Sometimes some relation is shown and sometimes there is no relation. We come to know whether relation is there or not. Whether increase in sales expenditure also increase the sales or say increase on sales expenditure keeps the sales constant or sales reduced. Sometimes if we spend money on the activities in a factory and those activities reduce the car, uh, wastage, then, then these are indirectly connected with the independent variable. So, we have to see the trend and then this is shown by the scatter diagram. <coughs> now, we will discuss something regarding training for Six Sigma. Aim is to create technical leaders. In this training, we have the aim to create technical leaders, teachers, users, breakthrough exercises for continual improvement and process owners for smooth and effective implementation of Six Sigma in an organization. And these individuals finally have the potential to identify critical problems present in the company and then they find out the solution to these problems. Depending on the understanding of the Six Sigma philosophy, theory and application tactics as well as level of training and applications in the areas of descriptive statistics, non-parametric statistics, quantitative techniques, benchmarking, process control techniques, process diagnostic methods, experimental design as well as organizational group dynamics and change process. The Six Sigma players are then classified. Depending upon the, their potential, we classify these players and then these classifications are as given below. They are also called green belts, black belts, master black belt and champions. What is the meaning of green belt? We will discuss right now. <clears throat> and we may also have yellow, brown, white, silver and gold belts. Who is a enterprise leader? The leadership model that is most effective in the deployment of Six Sigma and visions the leader as problem solver. Leader is the person who solves a problem. Leader's job is to implement systems that identify and solve problems. He is to give us the systems and then those systems will finally solve the problems. These requires two steps. The first one is allocate resources to support team based problem identification and solution activities. And second step is allocate resources to install corrections and ensure that the problems will not reoccur. <clears throat> now, under Six Sigma roles and responsibilities, we will define the responsibilities of black belts who are also known as agents or program managers. Black belts work full time on Six Sigma projects. These projects are usually prioritized based on their potential financial impact on the enterprise. And these black belts are full time 
persons working on Six Sigma activities. And they carry out the projects which have maximum financial impact on the profitability of the organization. Now we have master black belt <clears throat> in the company. We have master black belts also. Master black belts have advanced knowledge in statistics and other fields and provide technical support to the black belts. Quality program master black belt is also known as MBB. Six Sigma are quality expert responsible for strategic implementation within the business. The master black belt is qualified to teach other Six Sigma facilitators the methodologies, tools and applications in all functions and levels of the company and is a resource for utilizing statistical process control within the process. So master black belt is responsible for carrying out the projects with the help of black belts. He is also there to train people working under him on the Six Sigma activities and on the Six Sigma philosophy. He is also there to control the statistical process control and st statistical quality control. He is to guide his people. He is to guide his people to have the projects completed on time and within the budget, and finally to see that implemented budget <coughs> generate extra profits with respect to the money spent on the projects. And then there are green belts also. A green belt works under the direction of a black belt, providing assistance with all phases of project operation. Green belts typically are less adept at statistics and other problem solving techniques. They have they have good idea of these techniques, but practically they are much below the experience level of black belts and the master black belts. These green, green belts work under the supervision of black belt. <clears throat> then there are champions. <clears throat> Who is a champion? A champion is typically top level manager who is familiar with the benefits of Six Sigma strategies and provides support for the program. He gives the resources required for completing the Six Sigma projects. Quality program champions, a business leader or senior manager who ensures that resources are available for training and projects and who is involved in project target. Reviews, also an executive who supports and ad addresses Six Sigma organizational issues. Issues present with respect to Six Sigma, he is there to solve those problems. <clears throat> executive, the most successful implementations of Six Sigma have had strong support from either the company president, the CEO, or another key executive. And this is the role of the executive to make the Six Sigma activities successful in the organization, to review the resources, to remove the problems, and troubleshoot them. And then there are process owners, those who own the process for which projects are there. The person who coordinates the various activities at all levels of a process has the authority or ability to make changes in the process as required because he is a person who knows best about the process and he manages the entire process cycle to ensure performance effectiveness. Prior to implementation of Six Sigma projects, he knows what exactly the process is. After implementation Six Sigma project, what this process will look like? What are the results going to be by use of Six Sigma projects. So he is there to own the responsibility of the process and the implementation of projects and final responsibility lies with the process owner. Now we have discussed different people and their responsibilities. We started with green belts, black belts, master black belts, champions, process owners and rather we started with leadership. Now we'll discuss some calculations which are related to the 
six sigma philosophy these are very important everyone must know these calculations because based on these calculations we work out the projects business results are measured through these calculations pro, pro, process performance matrix and the common matrix now we will define what is a defect a defect is any variation of the required characteristic of the product or its parts or services which is far enough from its target value to prevent the product from fulfilling the physical and functional requirements of the customer as viewed through the eyes of your customer and that is that thing is called the defect we want to minimize the number of defects while implementing six sigma a defect is also anything that causes the processor or the customer to make adjustments we don't want that the customer is required to make adjustments in the process or in the parts if he is required to make adjustments then it means defect is there in the process defect is there in the product whether it is raw material semi finished product anything that dissatisfies your customer is called defect now we will define a unit what do we mean by the unit a unit may be as diverse as a piece of equipment line of a software one order technical manual medical claim wire transfer hour of labor customer contract we can also have more examples one form form admission admission form form for opening an account in the bank form for <coughs> getting the draft made these are called the units and now we'll see if defects are present in these units or not and based on this information we'll make some calculations to know the process capability common metric defect per unit dpu is commonly used in companies where six sigma is implemented dpu defect per opportunity soon we'll discuss what we mean by the opportunity defect per opportunity is also called dpo and then dpmo defects per million opportunities it is known as dpmo <coughs> so lower dpu increases customer satisfaction and decreases warranty cost it's a fact and it is obvious also if defects per unit are less the customer satisfaction will be more and warranty cost will be less lower dpu reduces copq what is copq cost of poor quality is copq and decreases manufacturing cost per unit and this is achieved by lowering the value of dpu higher process capability indices increase six sigma rating and reduces dpu defects per unit business results process performance matrix now we'll discuss an example and this example will illustrate the use of several measures used in six sigma projects example is a process produces 40000 pencils three types of defects that can occur and the number of occurrences are as given below defects are blur printing 36 defects are found because of blurred printing wrong dimensions are found in 118 and rolled ends are found in 11 pencils total number of defects if we add them these are 165 now we'll calculate defects per unit dpu defects per unit is nothing but if we divide the total number of defects by the number of units inspected defects here are 165 out of 40000 pencils 165 divided by 40000 is 
0.4125 and this is DPU, DPU level is in this case 0 0.004125. Now, we will work out the defects per million opportunities. For this, we will have to calculate the opportunities present for having these kind of defects. Blurred printing in this example, this blurred printing, it occurs only in one way. So, there are 40,000 opportunities for this to occur because we have manufactured 40,000 pencils. Wrong dimensions, there are three independent places where dimensions are checked. So, in the batch, there are 3 into 40,000, 1 lakh 20,000 opportunities for dimensional defects to be present. At the rolled ends, rolled ends can occur at the top end or the bottom of the pencil. So, there are 2 into 40,000, 80,000 opportunities for this defect to occur. The total number of defects of opportunities for this case is 40,000 plus 1 lakh 80,000 plus 80,000 and the total is 2 lakh 40,000. Now, if we want to calculate DPM or defects per million opportunities, the defects found multiply this figure with 1 million and divide by total number of opportunities. So, in this case, 165 million divided by 240,000 is the answer, the value of DPM or defects per million opportunities. 687.5 is the value after making the calculation. Now, we will discuss throughput yield, also called the yield. Throughput yield, the formula for this is E raised to power minus DPU. DPU is nothing but as we discussed defects per unit. In this example, the throughput yield is e raised to power minus 0 0.00125 and the value is 0 0.996 and this is the yield. Roll throughput yield is also known as RTY. We have to calculate these kind of figures for making the assessment regarding the process. RTY applies to the yield from series of processes. A main process consists of a series of processes and we know the yield in each process and the final yield will only be product of all these individual yields. And this is found by multiplying the individual process yields. If a product goes through four processes whose yields are 0 0.994, 0 0.987, 0 0.951, and 0 0.990, then ultimate RTY will be product of all these individual yields and the final figure in this case is 0.924. So, 92.4 percent is the yield okay? and this is also known as rolled throughput yield RTY. When referring to defects, depending upon the parts per million, what do we mean by parts per million when referring to the defect? PPM, DPU into 1 million. In this exa example, PPM is 0 0.004125 multiplied by 1 million and the value is 4125. And these PPM means defects per million, 4125 the number of defects per million opportunities. PPM is also used to refer to contaminants. Suppose 0.23 grams of insect parts are found in 25 kilograms of the product, then PPM level is 0.23 into 1 million divided by 25,000 because 25 kilograms is the unit and this is 9.2 PPM. Cost of poor quality as we discussed earlier, COPQ calculates the rupee impact of defects. If we are having defects, what is the rupee impact? And this means that what is the cost of poor quality? This is helpful in prioritizing projects in terms of their impact on the enterprise. COPQ should include the expenses involved in rework, warranty, late deliveries, customer dissatisfaction and so on. 
So with these problems, if we have produced defects and if we consider all these problems like rework warranty, late deliveries and customer dissatisfaction, what these are going to cost us and this is the cost of poor quality. The Six Sigma team's problem solving process. Now we will discuss the main problem solving process which is a part of Six Sigma. In bringing a diverse team together, it is critical to have a common process or model that all members can share to get their work done. The answer to this need in Six Sigma is the to make process. The spellings are D M A I C and the pronunciation is do make. Define, measure, analyze, improve and control. This is a main process of problem solving. Do make. Do make team life cycle. Phase 1, identifying and selecting projects. Phase 2, forming the team. Phase 3, developing the charter. Phase 4, training the team. Phase 5, doing to make and implementing solutions. Phase 6, handing off solutions to the organization. To make problem solving model. Biggest advantages of do make boil down to seven items. Measuring problem, focusing on the customer, verifying root cause, breaking old habits, measuring risks, measuring results and sustaining change. These are the advantages of using DUMEC problem solving model. This is more to DUMEC than these seven advantages. Much more advantages are there if we discuss DUMEC and if we see what this philosophy is. But they are surely the most important as we review the five DUMEC steps, one will get a better idea how the process works. There is another term, DMADV. These two terms differ a little. Six Sigma is, a, is achieved through the use of two Six Sigma sub methodologies, DMAIC and DMADV. The Six Sigma DMAIC process define, measure, analyze, improve, control is an improvement system for existing processes. If we are looking for modification in the existing processes, we go for DUMAC. And if we are introducing new processes, we go for DMADV. Both Six Sigma processes are executed by Six Sigma green belts and Six Sigma black belts and are overseen by Six Sigma master black belts. DUMAC define the project goals and customer internal and ex external deliverables. Measure the process to determine current performance. Analyze and determine the root causes of the defects. Improve the process by eliminating defects and control future process performance. But when to use DUMAC? The DUMAC methodologies instead of the DMADV methodology should be used when a product or process is in existence at your company but is not meeting customer specifications or is not performing adequately. DMADV, define the project goals and customer internal and external deliverables. Measure and determine customer needs and specifications. Analyze the process options to meet the customer needs. Design detailed the process to meet the customer needs. Verify the design performance and ability to meet customer requirements. When to use DMADV? A product or process is not in existence at your company and one needs to develop it, then we shall be using DMADV. The existing product or process exists and has been optimized using either DUMAC or not and still does not meet the level of customer satisfaction or Six Sigma level. Now, we will differentiate between these two processes, DMAIC and DMADV. 
the similarities of DMAIC and DMADV. Six Sigma methodologies used to derive defect through less than 3.4 per million opportunities. Data intensive solution approaches, intuition has no place in Six Sigma. One cold and hard fact, implemented by green belts, black belts, and master black belt. Ways to help meet the business financial bottom line numbers implemented with the support of champion and process owners. Six Sigma DUMAC roadmap. This is also called DUMAC roadmap. Define phase. What does it mean? Define customers and their requirements. CTQs, critical to quality items. Develop problem statement, goals and benefits. Identify champion, process owner, and team members. Define resources. Evaluate key organizational support. Develop project plan and milestones. Develop high level process map. What do we mean by measure? The second item in DUMAC. Define defect opportunity unit and matrix. Here we have to calculate something. So we'll define the matrix. Detailed process map of appropriate areas. Areas concerned will be mapped. Develop data collection plan. The ways to collect the data are explained here. Validate the measurement system. Collect the data. Begin developing the formula y is equal to fx. Means y depends upon the fx. Then x is the independent variable. Y is the independent variable. Determine process capability and sigma baseline. Analyze phase. Define performance objectives. Identify value, non-value added process steps. Identify sources of variation. Determine root cause or causes and determine vital few axes and Y formula relationship. Vital few means we have to have 80-20 analysis, which are very important and which cannot be compromised. We have to identify those independent variables. Improve phase, perform design of experiments. It is another tool which is used by master black belts. Develop potential solutions, define operating tolerances of potential systems, assess failure mode of potential solutions. Validate potential improvement by pilot studies. Correct, reevaluate potential solution. And then final is a control phase. Define and validate monitoring and control system. Develop standards and procedures. Implement statistical process control. Determine process capability. Develop transfer plan. Hand off to process owner. Verify benefits, cost savings, avoidance, profit growth. Close project, finalize documentation, and communicate to business. And then finally, celebrate the results. Six Sigma deployment. For define and measurement phases, step one, self-assessment of the organization and share the results with the top management and employees. What is the existing condition of the process? We should narrate it to the employees. We should also tell it to the top management. This is the first step. Step two, re-evaluate all of the strategies and strategic objectives of the organization and identify new strategic objectives. Step three, identify all the organization's core processes and support processes. Build strategy map to help communicate the strategy. Six Sigma case study. Now we'll have a case study. In an IT call center, we have to discuss the customer satisfaction. And this is a problem we shall be sharing with the viewers. Benchmarking and the IT call center wants to benchmark its performance with the best available in the industry. Industry data was purchased from a clearing house that gathers a number of measures about customer satisfaction and call center technical and business performance. In a call center, we take care of the customer satisfaction and the problems like delay, 
communication. If somebody calls at a call center, if he is asked to wait, it is a dissatisfaction to the customer. If he is not given the correct reply, he is not satisfied. He is given a ambiguous answer or ambiguous reply, then he is not satisfied. These are the irritants and these make the customer unsatisfied. So, comparing the company to the benchmark average and to a select best in class group, we can find that customer satisfaction with the support services was just average or a bit below. And we have found that the performance of this particular call center was average or below the average value. How we are saying this? We have collected the data and found the results and these results are shown in the subsequent slides. This figure 1, see it carefully. This is showing histogram of the performance and the x axis shows the customer satisfaction 68, 70, 72, 74 and 76. These are the figures showing the customer satisfaction and this satisfaction is achieved by the frequency. Frequency level is also shown which is shown on the y axis and this histogram superimposed by a normal distribution. Normal distribution is a curve which is shown in the graph and if we see the right hand table, <laughs> this shows the Anderson Darling normality test. This test is performed to know the normality of the data, the data which was put to this test whether it is normally distributed or not. This is known through Anderson Darling normality test and number of software are available. A squared value is given and the P value is given and the next value is mean and this mean is for the customer satisfaction. Mean has been calculated by the software and this value is 72.6389 and the standard deviation of the data is also given this is 2.2752 variance which is nothing but square of standard deviation is also given 5.17 skewness of the data are also given skewness shows that whether the data is skewed towards left or skewed towards right skewed towards positive values or skewed towards negative values minimum value is also given and the number of observations are also given here number of observations are 36 and two values are worth noting here. One is the mean value which is in the range of 72, 73 and standard deviation which is 2.27 and this is regarding the customer satisfaction data for the call center for which we are making the study. Next slide shows a similar data on the average companies those who are performing average, the data is shown for those companies. In this diagram, we have the customer satisfaction and the frequency level, rather histogram superimposed by the normal curve. Here also Anderson Darling normality test has been put, number of observations taken are 36, same as in our example or same as in our call center which is under study. Mean value here is 76, in our case it was 72, standard deviation is 2.55, in our case it was 2.7. Both the things are favorable as far as the companies whose performance is average because the mean value of customer satisfaction is more and the standard deviation is less and both are favorable as far as average companies are concerned because we want that the customer satisfaction should be more and more and the variation in the customer satisfaction should be less and less and this variation is shown by the standard deviation and it shows that <coughs> standard deviation is 2.5 as compared to 2.7 mean value of customer satisfaction is also more than the 
value of the call center under study. Now we will have the figures for the best in the industry. The similar figures are available for the companies which are best. Customer satisfaction for best in class companies. Here as we see the graph, histogram bars are much higher in size. This shows that the mean value will be more. Customer satisfaction as plotted with respect to the frequency after carrying out the Anderson Darling normality test where A squared values and the P values are calculated which are all favorable and show that the data can be considered or can be assumed to be normally distributed. In this case the mean value is 87.2, standard deviation 1.2385 and variance 1.53, variance is nothing but square of standard deviation, skewness is also there and the number of observations taken are 36, minimum value of the customer satisfaction is 83. Now we will compare the results. In our case, this mean value was 72 and this value where the best in the, in the industry is 87, which is much higher than the case which we are studying. 72 and 87, a large difference is there. There is large scope to make improvement in the customer satisfaction. Standard deviation is also 1.2. In our case, it was 2.7. So, these kind of studies are made on the performance of any organization. Here, the studies are made on the call center. Average values are noted and the best values are noted. Now, we know that where we are working, where do we stand and where the modifications are required, where the modifications, if made properly, will give the results. Customer satisfaction and then things will be improved. What sort of projects are to be carried out? These master black belts with the help of black belts and with the help of green belts will ca carry out the projects and finally they will improve the customer satisfaction. Same study we have noted by analyzing the customer satisfaction data, we can find that customer satisfaction has positive influence to new account growth. After studying the data, as we discussed earlier, the scatter diagram. A scatter diagram has been made with two variables, customer satisfaction best and new account best. These values are noted and these follow the straight line. It means the new account growth are directly related to the customer satisfaction and if we work on the new account growth, we can improve the customer satisfaction. So, we will have to have the projects where the customer satisfaction is improved. Six Sigma case study again same thing, transfer average number of transfers to different agents and help systems during a service call. See, if a customer calls a call center, if his call is transferred, then this particular statement is used or particular word is used transfer, which is also measure of customer satisfaction. Average transfer is average number of transfers to different agents and help systems during a service call. And the wait time is another factor, average wait time during a service call. Service average service time during the call, the time spent getting the answer to the question, problem solving, advice, etcetera. Here we have discussed three, four things which are responsible for cu customer satisfaction. One is transfer. If <coughs> a customer calls a call center and the operator receives the call, if operator is not able to answer the query of the customer, then he is going to transfer the call to some other operator or to some senior person and this is, this should not be more in the transactions. If these are more, these are going to delay the customer replies. So, this should be minimized. Similarly, waiting time, 
average time the customer has to wait in the queue. If a customer calls and then he is supposed to wait for some time, then it is an irritant. So, it also dissatisfies the customer. And the service, average time required to get the custom, customer serviced. Maybe waiting time and giving the replies. These two times are totaling up to the service time. From the regression model, we can find that longer the wait time, transfer time and service, the lower the customer satisfaction. If all these times are more, these will reduce the customer satisfaction. These are related directly to the customer satisfaction. So, this we obtain through regression model and all these data are put to regression and then we get the results whether they are directly related to the customer satisfaction or not. If they are directly related to the customer satisfaction, we will have to have projects regarding these particular irritants. So, that finally, if these irritants are removed or their if impact is reduced, the customer will be more satisfied. From the data, what was gathered from the industry, we found that the call centers waiting time is lower than industry average. Thus, there is space for improvement and it will help reduce the cost and increase customer satisfaction. <coughs> These three distributions are drawn. The dotted is for the company, dotted red one is for the company. The blue support cost for call average and yellow one is support cost per call the best. So, we want to achieve the best, we will have to benchmark our results, benchmark our process with the best available in the industry. <laughs> From the data, we can find that the call center's cost is higher than average. So, this project is doable. Now, we will de devote some more time on the defined phase in the DUMEC philosophy, project charter problem statement. Competitors are growing their levels of satisfaction with support customers and they are growing their businesses while reducing support costs per call. Our support costs per call have been level or rising over the past 18 months and our customer satisfaction ratings are at or below average. Unless we stop or better reverse this trend, we are likely to see compounded business erosion over the next 18 months. <coughs> this is done through defined phase, same call center performance is being discussed and reviewed. Business case, increasing our new business growth from 1 percent to 4 percent or better would increase our gross revenues by about rupees 3 million. If we can do this without increasing our support cost per call, we should be able to realize a net gain of at least rupees 2 million and this is after making the customer satisfied. This is the effect of having projects for improving the customer satisfaction. In Six Sigma philosophy, we see the bottom line figures only. If the results are positive, only then we go for those projects, otherwise we will not touch those projects. Goal statement, <coughs> increase the call centers industry measured customer satisfaction rating from its current level <coughs> 90th percentile, which is equal to 75 percent to the target level 90th percentile, which is equal to 85 percent by end of the fourth quarter without increasing support cost. This is our aim, this is our goal statement which we are going to achieve and this will be achieved by having Six Sigma projects. Under this define phase, team roles, presentation skills, project management skills, group techniques, quality, pitfalls to quality improvement projects, project strategies and a use of software which is mini tab. This is used in deployment means define phase. What we do? In measurement phase, 
quality tools, risk assessment, measurements, capability, and performance, measurement systems analysis, quality function deployment, and FMEA. <coughs> there is another tool which is called FMEA, failure mode effect analysis. And then QFD is also used, quality function deployment, house of quality, another tool which is used by master black belt. A method for meeting customer requirements, uses tools and techniques to set product strategies, displays requirements in matrix diagram, including house of quality, produces design initiatives to satisfy customer and beat competitors. We will give you an example of house of quality also. All these components of the house show different metrics. First one is customer requirements on the walls of the house. Then competitor assessment on the wall, relationship matrix again on the wall, front wall. Product characteristics on the upper top. And then trade off matrix, the shed or the roof, technical assessment and target values at the floor. So, this makes the house of quality and with this matrices, we are able to know what exactly is required to be put in the product and what is required in the process. This takes care of the voice of customer as well as voice of process. Voice of customer and voice of process when combined together, what we can deliver and what customer is requiring and what features are to be incorporated in the product which are made known by use of house of quality or quality function deployment techniques. And what are the benefits of QFD? Lead times, the time to market and time to stable production. If you want to launch a product, this reduces the time for launching a new product by using QFD technique. Startup costs are reduced, engineering changes are less. Analysis phase, hypothesis testing, tools are used comparing samples, confidence intervals, multivariate analysis, ANOVA and regression are used. Improvement phase, history of design of experiments, DOE, design of experiments, P planning and factors, DOE, practical workshop, DOE analysis, response service methodology, optimization and lean manufacturing. And we have already discussed <coughs> The example also regarding the quality function deployment, regarding the improvements in the call center activities and this is used through Six Sigma philosophy and through Dumac philosophy and the using different tools. There are different tools which are higher in level which are being used by the master black belts. So today we have learned lot of things, we have learned calculations also, we finished whatever we left regarding the tools of quality control and in the next lecture we will devote more time on the philosophy of Six Sigma.